we know quite a lot about it. The one on the left is remarkable because it is the work of a single-celled creature, an amoeba. No nervous system, no brain, it's just one cell. And yet, it makes this little house quite remarkable. Now let's look at another sand castle that's made by this creature, caddis fly larva. There's its sand castle. It's a, it's a food sieve, which it builds in the moving water in a stream, and it uses it to catch food. And you can see how elegantly it's designed. Uh, uh, not only does it have the nice funnel for the water to come in and another one to go out, but it has this extra passage, you can see it here on the top view, so that it can get both sides of the screen and yet have the screen blocking off the, the, the interior passage. That's very well designed. In fact, in some regards, I think it's better designed than this, which is another way of getting food out of water using a sort of sieve. Both of these things are really quite wonderfully designed. What's the difference? Well. I want to say there's reasons for the arrangement of the parts in both cases. In the caddis larva's food sieve, there are reasons, and in the lobster trap. The difference is that in the caddis case, the reasons are not represented anywhere. They're not represented in the caddis larva's little nervous system, and they're not represented in the process of natural selection that designed the caddis larva's nervous system, but they are the reasons nonetheless. They're what I call the free-floating rationales of evolution. I've been using this term for a number of years, and I don't know, I think probably it was not a well-chosen term because a lot of people just, just hate it, or they just, they, they don't, they think I'm talking about something mysterious. So one of my main purposes here is to demystify the notion of free-floating rationales of evolution. I'm going to use one of my favorite examples, which is the cuckoo chick. Cuckoos, as you know, I know, I'm here in this department of ecology and evolutionary biology, and there's bird experts in the room, so I'm, I'm carrying coals to Newcastle here, but some of you may not know about this. So, so cuckoos are brood parasites. They don't make their own nests, and they don't incubate their own eggs. When the female cuckoo is ready to lay her egg, she finds a host nest, some other species, a thrush or a warbler, and she waits until they have finished their nest and laid their eggs, and then when they fly off to feed, she darts down really quick, lays her egg, pushes one of the, uh, one of the, of the host eggs out. That's in case the host can count. <laughs> yes, that's the reason. And flies off, never to return. The hosts come back, they incubate the egg, then they feed the chick when it's born. But it's not just that, because the first thing the chick does when it hatches, and it has a shorter incubation time than the host species, generally speaking, the first thing it does is, it's, it, it can hardly see, it's this little featherless, scrawny little thing, is it pushes the eggs, the other eggs out. Why? Well, to maximize its own return. And I'm going to show you. Whoop. Go back. Okay, well, we'll just do without it. <laughs> what I was going to show you was a little, a little video clip which shows this action with a, 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 a thrush's nest, and, and you see the thrush sitting on the eggs, and boop, boop, the eggs start being pushed out of the nest on the ground. Uh, uh, by the, by the little cuckoo chick. Yeah. There is absolutely no mistaking this. This is, this is purpose of behavior. And the reason why is also very clear. This is, not, this is not a fluke. This is not an accident. This is what cuckoo chicks do. You will be maybe relieved to recognize that the cuckoo chick doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> it knows not the, what should we call it? Ovicide that it is committing. Uh, but it is the beneficiary of this behavior that is nicely wired into it. Well now, how can these be the reasons if no reasoner thought them up? Well, 
I want to just walk very slowly through this. Natural selection is what you might call an automatic reason finder. The process blindly discovers, endorses, and focuses reasons over many generations. Here's how it goes. Consider a population with a lot of variation in it. Okay, some do well, some don't. Every generation, some do well, some don't. In each case, we can ask of any one individual, why did it do better? And sometimes the answer will be no reason. It just happened, you know, it was lucky or it was unlucky. It never went over by a bus, uh, hit by lightning, or uh, just happened to be in the right place when all the food was there or when the food wasn't there, whatever. In many cases, the answer is no reason, just luck. But if there's a subset, perhaps very small, of cases where there is an answer to this question, not that anybody in nature is asking it, then what the cases have in common provides the germ of a reason. And this is what natural selection then promotes, in effect, amplifies, discovers, endorses. So what happens is that natural selection tracks reasons creating things that have purposes, but that don't need to know them, like the cuckoo chick. In espionage, we have the famous need-to-know principle. In the case of the CIA uh, and uh, 007, the idea is that if an agent doesn't know something, he can't spill it if you give her waterboarding. So, the idea is that agents should know as little as possible about the circumstances and purposes of what they're up to so that, so that they can't give it away to the enemy. That's one reason for the need to know principle, but in biology it's much simpler, it's just thrift. If an organism doesn't need to know why this is a good thing to do, it won't. It'll just be wired up to do it and be the beneficiary without knowing why. And of course, this is true of natural selection itself. It doesn't need to know what it's doing. That was Darwin's great discovery. And notice how much it is like Turing. The computer doesn't need to know what it's, how, why it's doing what it's doing. It just has to have the competence. Now, there's a common error that needs to be pointed out at this point. And that is that when we see some clever animal, say, doing something very very, very purposeful, we're inclined to attribute much more understanding to the agent than need be. It's a very natural tendency, and I think the explanation for this is simple. We just don't have the language, we don't have the terms in everyday speech for talking about what we're actually observing, which is, if you like, semi-understood quasi-representations, or even hemi-semi-demi-understood pseudo-representations. You'll notice that there is no I, I dare say there's no term in Norwegian either. No simple term for this. But that notice is exactly what Turing provides. That's what computer science provides. Wonderful examples by the thousand of what you might call hemi semi demi understood pseudo representations built up to do more and more and more. Now, sometimes birds do things where you think there's a lot more understanding. And I dare say, if we can win this one. Aha. So far, 